my soft tail about cat house. Right now, I'd like to talk about something else and the reason that you're all here. Okay. I would like to talk about a movie that when I saw it, it was different from every other horror movie ever. And I think we have a video to play, even though we're all here, we know that we're going to be talking about the movie Hellraiser. Like 
an anchoress. I think it's like a, a, a monk who is completely withdrawn from life. And, and actually, in Hellraiser, we shot inserts of uh, the four of us in our little cells, in little areas. And all, all we did was pace up and down when we weren't, you know, on call. We were just pacing up and down. And there were like fetishistic images and things. So, I have no idea because I was blind, so... <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, was just walk up and down, I mean, okay, I don't know where I am or who's with well, me. I, I, I guess Satterbites walking up and down was a bit dull, so I think it, I think it, didn't, it didn't make the movie. But that, I've always thought it's, it's, it's that element that makes Hellraiser so strong. The important bit is, aside from all the strangeness with the box and the Satterbites and their whole world, that fundamental basic story is rock solid strong, and it's that that makes Hellraiser work. And the brilliant, brilliant performances of this man, and Claire Higgins, in the, the central roles, which what drives the movie. Andrew, you sort of play the game <coughs> from so at one point during the movie, and when you heard about this movie, what, what were, how were they proposing it to you? How did they bring up this title? Of this would be what you were going to be doing in it. You know, quite, quite honestly, I, 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 I have no, I, 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 don't, I can't remember that. All I remember is that when I was asked to meet Clyde, um, and they were talking about there's this movie, it's a weird movie, shot I was loving like that. And so I went and I met him, and I fell in love with Clyde. He, he was clearly the smartest man in the room. Clearly. And he was so bright and sharp, and 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 he looked like this sort of like choir boy, you know. I mean, it was like extraordinary. And then when I read, I read his books, especially the books of blood. I mean, that knocked me out because I'd never read horror, horror before. I'd, I'd never read. I'd never even read Stephen King. And when I read these books, this okay. was like this was amazing literature, real literature. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, mean, I, I have no idea what to expect, none whatsoever. But I do so agree with Doug about, you know, the, the thing is, is that all great horror comes out of family situations. You know, I mean, and this was a family situation, and the horror just came right out of the I, I think Clive described Hellraiser as Ipsy with monsters. <laughs> Simon, that's how it was sold to me because I'm a great Shakespeare and then Ibsen Chekhov. That's the kind of the, the theatre I was doing before. But, um, yes. Yeah. So, such a, a normal transition that would have you as Butterball. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, when that yeah. comes up, Ibsen when that comes up, up how do they say to you, you know, we want you to play the set of light? Oh, the mic's off. Yeah. Hear me, for Christ's sake, I'm a trained actor. <laughs> so, Simon, what is it? How, how do they do an audition for Butterball? I mean, what do they want you to do? Because you don't like this. You don't like this. It's like, okay, with this big setup, you know. How, I don't know because I didn't audition for it. So I, I, I've known Clive for a while, and, and Doug, and um, we did Fringe Theatre when we were all starving actors, and, and Clive was a starving writer in London. And um, I joined quite late in the day for that. Um, eventually, they disbanded the company because we realised that we needed, to, if we wanted to do this as a profession, we needed to earn money from it. We don't really do that from profit share. So um, we all went into which always means a show of zero. Zero. <laughs> but especially when Clive was creating skinned men on stage with no budget. Um, so any profit we did have was creating these extraordinary effects. Um, yes. <laughs> so uh, we disbanded, the, the company disbanded, and we all went and did more commercial theatre for a few years. And I just ran Clive out the blue to see how he was and what he was up to. And uh, we were chatting, and he said, oh yeah, I'm, I'm about to, to make a film. He just had two films, um, 
screenplays made into films that weren't hugely successful. Uh, Warhead Rex and um, Underworld. Underworld. He 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 wrote the uh, the uh, screenplays for them. Um, but he did, and I, I remember going to there was a cast and crew screening in Leicester Square of Underworld, and uh, Clive said, "Do you want to come along?" I said, "Sure." And did that. Um, and I remember standing on the pavement, the sidewalk, um, outside the cinema afterwards. And uh, Clive said, well, I think I recognised two lines of my screenplay. You know, it seems to me that if I'm going to do this, I'd better do it myself. Yeah. So that was what he did. He, he persuaded them to let him write and direct the next film, and I just happened to ring him at the right time, and he said, so, I'm going to be doing this, this film, do you want to play a monster? And uh, I said, yeah. So, that was it. But they picked you to do Butterball, which I could be wrong, <laughs> but was that the heaviest of the Cenobites? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think Clive's always been a bit of a visionary, and he, I think he saw that later in my life I would be, I would be beginning to do I mean, you know, I do quite like my pies. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what that says about me. I guess you would be the most patient because I imagine I know you've been asked this question a million times, but to be Pinhead must have been so incredibly time consuming. Time consuming? The time to take a lot of time to oh, make up on. I, I occasionally get asked the audition question by fans, and sometimes late on a Saturday afternoon, when you know my brain is a bit glazed and I'm getting a bit mischievous, I have said, I have occasionally said, they put me in a room with uh, closed circuit cameras uh, and a hammer and a bunch of nails, and they told me to get creative. <laughs> And what happens is this, people go, oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, uh, my, my long-suffering uh, darling wife kicks me under the table. <laughs> and uh, I'm left having to go, wait, 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 no, wait, wait, excuse me. That's not what happened. Um, I just got asked to do it. The makeup took, um, early on, five or six hours, um, after that, and generally about three or four. People were always terribly impressed on my behalf. What I always point out to them was that I didn't do anything during that time. I just sat on my house and drank coffee and listened to music and made a nuisance of myself. <laughs> the special effects makeup guys worked throughout that time with their backs bent and, and having to concentrate and focus through all that time they were brilliant. to make that image look as perfect as it did brilliant. on screen. I didn't do it. Were you a little bit shocked after the first movie came out? Because Pinhead, I don't think you were really called Pinhead in the first movie, right? It doesn't say you weren't called necessarily Pinhead. Well, uh, the, the satellites are all anonymous in the Hellbound Hell. We were all anonymous, really, in the in the movie. I've always said if I was um, if I was a if I was a method actor, we'd have been in trouble. <coughs> uh, you know, I, I've been told that when Daniel Day Lewis was shooting Lincoln, he would only answer to Mr. President <laughs> on set. Um, so, and I found this when I came to work in in, in America. The, the tendency is for directors and assistant directors not to call you by your name, but to call you by your character name throughout the day, because a lot of actors don't want to break the concentration and focus of being in their character. I've always said we'd be in trouble, because if I followed that line of thinking, I wouldn't respond to Doug, and I wouldn't respond to Pinhead, because it's not his name. Uh, could you tell him I'm busy? <laughs> Because it's not his name, as far as I'm concerned. Certainly in his, in his head, he doesn't have a name. 
So I think I, I was I was the lead set. You were lead, yeah. Um, I was. I'll never forget it, so. I was going to fat and thin of money. Did you have it? Were you on the set? Did you make everybody refer to you as Butterball? No, fat, fat Cinnabites, and then there was female Cinnabites, and I don't know what the next name was. Was it Fat and Cinnabites? Yeah, it's Cheryl. 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 No, but that was the, 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 the name that the crew gave us. The, yeah. the crew gave us Butterball and Pinhead yes. and Cheshire. Because when, when they were crew, you? Yeah, no, it wasn't what was in the script. Oh, that's so hilarious. When, they were when, when, when the movie was being prepped and they were working on the makeups, they couldn't, you know, they needed to give us names, and they were the names we came up with, and because those names had been being used throughout the prep, they were the names that were being used by everybody on the set. Yeah. So they, they and the, the, fe the female set of mine was, was well, Deep Throat, <laughs> which they decided it was a step too far sexually and politically. <laughs> Did we have our names on Hellbound? I'm, I'm not sure about that, or were we still... No, I think, we, then, I think, I think we must have done. We'd acquired names. Yeah, 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 we, yeah. Did, we did, we did have that. Yes. Uh, but in, 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 in my own mind, that's not his name. Nobody's ever called him Pinhead in the movies. Uh, but the one person I think called him A Pinhead, which is a different thing. Andrew, in the movie, you, I mean, you get Henry and stuff like that, but coming out of this project, how were you first told about it, and what was it like for you to come into this movie? Oh, you mean, you because it was an all, was it all English crew? Oh, yeah, the crew was all English, absolutely. Yeah. I, I have no idea why I was, you know, I guess they were, I mean, if they were looking for an American, I, 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 I would have thought they would have looked for someone who, you know, who could have, Hunt them up at the box office. You know, I mean, it, I don't know why an Englishman didn't play this role. I have no idea. But I can't think of anybody else playing any of the other roles. You know, I mean, that you were so good at that, and the same thing with Doug. Yeah, I, I, I'm, you were a great butterball, but I never really this saw. But there was something about it that you made these characters your own. And, and, and Doug. Did you find it odd, like, if you look around and there's a lot of people in this room that probably have pinhead tattoos, that people were so enamored with his pinhead, but in the first movie, you didn't really have that many lines, did you? No, and I think I, think I was on screen a bit, I think we were all on screen a bit under 10 minutes. I had no notion. Clive's focus was Julian. Uh, he, he, the, the, he, he was creating the first great female monster in horror films. That was his focus. And I, I, I honestly think he was a little bit peed off that, that we kind of snuck past him and said, <laughs> Hey, hi guys, here we are. Uh, but the, the, he didn't realize that he could create these extraordinary images and put them up on a big screen and that the horror fans weren't going to go, what? Wait, hold on, yeah, no, what, what, this is he, what an actor, he's fine, yeah, but can we the Cenobites? More, please, you know, it seems to be inevitable, but it certainly never crossed my mind. I didn't, I had no idea that fandom existed, conventions didn't really exist. Probably then I did my first convention in 1989, which was Fangoria, and that was all I did. Yeah. Um, Fangoria, <laughs> um, not like now. I mean, you can do one every weekend. It seems to me now, if you're if you're mad enough. Um, and, and you know, I, I've said before, it was my first movie. I was being paid uh, union minimum rates to do it. I think we all, if we'd been paid any less, we were officially extras, I think. Um, and I'm playing this character with no name, covered in latex, who's on screen for barely 10 minutes. What do I have to be excited about? You know? I, I knew it was something extraordinary. I knew the image of what, what, what I was seeing in the mirror. You know, Clive was getting so excited when he got all of us on set for the first time. It was something extraordinary. I honestly thought, and I think this, this partly goes back to Simon talking about the theatre days. Clive was writing 
extraordinary place, wonderful place, and we were all pretty damn good, I think. Um, and we sort of expected, particularly when we left Liverpool and came down to London, that we would lay out our wares before, before the great folk of London and would all go, oh my god, you're geniuses. And, you know, the streets paved with gold and, and the keys to the mansion on the hill would be presented to us. And by and large, London sniffed and coughed and spat on the floor and went on its way. And, you know, we were performing to three mile a pottery guard. And, and um, uh, we did have successes. We, we went to the Edinburgh Festival and we were very successful. It wasn't all uh, doom and gloom by any means at all. But I think, I think part of that followed me into Hellraiser. And I think I thought, I knew we were doing something interesting and something slightly against the grain. I thought, you know, we'd make a bit of a splash for a few weeks and then it would go away. We, even when the movie came out, Time Out magazine in London that week it, uh, was, was pinhead. Boom, nothing else, just close up of the face on the front cover of Time Out. And I was completely uncredited for it, as, as I wanted every image of Pinhead that accompanied a lot of articles about the movie and reviews I was always uncredited with it. So my expectations honestly weren't high. Even though we're halfway, halfway through filming Hellraiser, they were beginning to talk about a sequel. But you hear that talk and you kind of ignore it. You know, if you had suggested to me then, what, what, I, I lose count now, what, where are we, 37 years later, I'd be sitting in Orlando, Florida, answering questions about this movie. You know, when we were sitting in, in that back room at 6 o'clock, on a damp Tuesday morning, having having latex glued on my face, I would have thought you were out of your tiny mind. <laughs> did you ever, did, did you ever show up the set at the same time? Because there was times when you had, you know, quite a bit of makeup on. But when you no, it was just that one time. Right. I mean, the, the one. Well, I actually, well, the one time when they had to take a, you know, a a, a life mask of me so that they could. They could Rip, rip me apart. Yeah, but, but then when I did play Frank and I had, you know, the bits and pieces that were still, you know, like coming together. That's one of my favorite moments. Oh, I love is, it. is that so? I oh, I just see the eye. No, no. I mean, it just looks like amazing, amazing. I had such a good time on that film. Such a good time. When you think about it, and then we're going to take a couple questions. I don't know how much time we have. But if you kind of break down, Joy was the most evil person in that film. I think if you look at the characters, she was a really evil person. Sometimes they call terrible Cenobites. But Joy was the, the, the real villain in that movie. Absolutely. I mean, I, I had, I mean, like Clive saying to, to Simon, do you want to play a monster in, in the movie? I had in my head, approaching the movie, I'm going to play the monster in a horror movie. That's pretty cool. Cool, uh, you know, that's good. But reading the screenplay and then in the process of filming, no, Pen Penhead is, um, he's a judge, he's, he's, a, he's a dispassionate umpire uh, on what's going ahead. The monsters are Frank and Julie, uh, almost the Greek chorus. Yes, yes. yes. Yeah. Simon, we read the chorus line. A green chorus line. <laughs> I missed miss the dance. <laughs> That's the extended cut that we'll never see. <laughs> they cut the tap dance numbers out. I always thought that was a shame. But it will really excel. <laughs> when you were given the script um, for Butterball, what did you rehearse? I mean, what were the things you had to do to get to, to prepare for this? Um, rehearsal. <laughs> rehearsal. We, we did not have any rehearsal at all. So the first day on set was the first time we'd really seen the makeups. So um, oh, we, 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 we had to make a test, didn't we? They screen tested the makeups, yes. Because originally we had had pins, uh, which was fine as long as the camera was up close, but as soon as the camera went away, you couldn't read them at all. Just 
like I was poor. Um, so I took the decision to, to make them nails, really, rather than pens, and felt that my baby blues were undercutting, was undercutting the, <laughs> the power of the makeup, so that the decision was made then to put the, the black contact lenses in um, as well. But otherwise, first time we were all on set together, was yeah. to start filming. Yeah. So, so in, in the makeup chair beforehand, once the makeups were all on, um, I had no idea how the makeup was gonna was gonna work, how it was gonna move, how I could animate the face. Uh, it was two inches thick, and I, I was completely blind. So I was talking to Doug, saying, "Okay, I'm gonna if I move this face a little bit, can you tell me how it is coming across?" And uh, and and I did some kind of subtle kind of film type, you know, very small movements. And he said, "So when you're ready to start, just." Sort of start. <laughs> Are you going to do something? Do. <laughs> yeah, okay, okay, so that's not working so well. Uh, so, uh, oh dear, okay, so then uh, I'll play. How about this then? So there are a lot of idiots in the world, 
you know, there's, there's no question. We all know this. I mean, but, you know, people who are confused about what's real and what's not. Uh, but, I mean, what, what else is new? What, what is your question? Uh, one, I'd like to thank Doug for being extremely reasonable when you come get stuff autographed and take a selfies. Uh, for huge fans, that's great. I saw some actual fans actually give you some stuff earlier today, which was phenomenal. My second thing is, do you guys have anything that happened on the sets that were like off the wall that you guys remember that was just hilarious to you guys? That stood out that you guys still remember this day like, oh my God, that was fucking funny. I'm American, we don't do that. <laughs> This is not, and I, I, I blank it, but I'm sure there, there, there were such moments. Um, but I don't clearly remember them. Also, I, I mean, it, my, my, my first day, and this was my first movie, so my first moment in, in front of a camera is uh, We Want the Man Who Did This. Um, now, I'm wearing a skirt, I'm wearing contact lenses, which are completely dark, not made to my prescription, and the set is very dark. So, all I have to do is start here, walk to here, raise my hand to there, and say, we want the man who did this. Okay. So, don't this is your mark. <laughs> <laughs> so they, they've put a soundbite down behind my heels. Now, that's perfectly normal. I didn't know that. I thought I was being treated like the slightly slow kid. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. And then this will be your finishing mark. So then they nail a piece of wood or put another sandbag down so you can touch it with your toe and you know to stop. Perfectly normal. I didn't know that. I don't really think I'm stupid. Um, and your, your eye line will be just this side of the camera. Um, I have no idea where the camera is. And after they hold up a little torch for you to look at it, which they actually call a pin mark. Um, so shall we rehearse this? Okay. Because <laughs> I tripped over the skirt. <laughs> so they got clothes pegs and rolled up the bottom three inches of the skirt and pegged it. So all my sense of grandeur and majesty is <laughs> Are, you know, sandbag, skirt pegged up, step, 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 stop. Yeah. So things got better after that. But, uh, uh, when they said, can, uh, can we rehearse this now? A voice behind the camera, and I never know, lo located who it was. I know it wasn't high, but I really don't know who it was. But I, I've often thought maybe if I get around to writing my actual memoirs uh, or autobiography, it would be my title because this voice very audibly from behind the camera said, and, and that was these these were the only words I had to say that day. We want the man who did this. Voice said, does he know his line? <laughs> 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 We did a hidden camera thing on North Beach once 
where a lot of the strip clubs, especially you know back in the 60s, early 70s, where a lot of really funky clubs were. And so my character, the killer, comes out of one of uh, comes out of the strip club, and there's a, there's a there's a, a, a truck across the street with a camera in it. And then I come out of I come out of the uh, strip club. I make a right, and then there's an alley, and I go up the alley and I disappear. And then at that point, it's it's, it's a moment in the film when when uh, uh, Dirty Harry is, is chasing the killer. And so Clint came out of the same strip club, uh, following me. He makes a right. He goes up the alley. So I go up this alley, and I, I you know and, I, and I'm out, I know that I'm out of the camera. You know, the camera can't see me anymore, and I turn around the corner. And I, I sit there, and I wait for them to yell, cut. And, and there are these two really rough characters there. And they look at me, and I'm, you know, I'm dressed as this, you know, this, this idiot. Um, wait, wait, so wait a second. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Doug's here. No. He's busy. <laughs> So these two guys, they look, they, they look at me like I'm a fresh piece of meat. You know, they're literally licking their chops. What's this guy doing in the tenderloin, you know, by himself, you know, uh, looking the way he does? And, they're, and they start making a move on me. At that moment, Clint Eastwood comes around the corner and comes behind me. This, this, this couldn't have been staged any better. And then they don't see him. And then he says, What's going on here? <laughs> and they, they turn around, and there's Clint, who's oh. towering above him. <laughs> Which was why he saved my ass. <laughs> you know, and they, they split. Now, did they recognize it? No, they didn't recognize it. They just thought it was this big guy. Oh, they thought it was just a guy. <laughs> I thought it would have been cool. They turn around like, holy shit, this guy's got Clint Eastwood. <laughs> Everybody, I want to thank these guys. Thank you.